put this video Jeff Nippert, friend of the show. How does to how to get lean and stay lean forever using science? New Year as well. I'm trying to get under. Look at my man's titties, dude. Can you just look at this man's titties? God damn. Ten percent body fat for the first time in a few years. However, if you follow fitness content at all, you've probably also heard that most diets fail over the long term. And this is true. Just take a look at this study on the Biggest Loser contest, which followed up on the participants from the 2009 show six years after the show was over. Out of the 14 people who participated in the study, only one person had kept their weight off after six years. Five of the 14 subjects had regained all of their weight back, and two of the 14 ended up weighing more than they did before the show even started. So fully half the subjects had at least gained all their weight back. Similarly, this 2020 systematic review on the challenge of keeping it off pulled the results of eight separate weight loss studies and found that while all the studies were able to induce weight loss during the dieting period, they also all saw average weight regain after the diet was over, with a few studies showing overshoot beyond the original starting. He's gonna say things that are super common sense that people, for some weird reason, I haven't even watched the video, but no matter what happens, here, here's my take on it before we listen to the expert here, okay? Your diet is not a intermediary, like, one month, two month, three month, six month, one year thing. Your diet is your diet for the rest of your life. So you have to make literal dietary good habits that you can keep consistently for the rest of your life. It's, that's it, okay? It's about a lifestyle change. A lot of people, unfortunately, literally lose a lot of weight quick uh, style programming, okay? And that is what leads to unhealthy yo-yo dieting. You should not be losing more. You should not be losing more weight than uh, uh, one pound a week maximum. Obviously, that differs if you're like really, really, really obese. In which case, there's a lot of water weight, so that fluctuation is fine. Okay, but this is something that I do. Sugar addicts absolutely seething. No, I'm a sugar addict. I have an insane sweet tooth. Okay, I love pizza. I love all the bad shit. I was fat. I was very fat. For my entire life until I wasn't. And that's because you can substitute shit. One, you can have all that stuff in moderation. Two, you can also make like substitutes that are good enough that a lot of people refuse to recognize. One of the substitutes immediately that comes to mind is like, well, not for pizza. Pizza is like pretty bad across the board, but like for sweets, I use smart sweets, right? I love, I love sugary, delicious things. I love ice cream. So uh, new ice cream that I've been eating. Oh my god, it's this like Swedish brand called Nix. It's insane. 320 calories a pint. Better than Halo Top. Probably the best ice cream I've ever had. It's insane, okay? Not an ad. Don't give a f That shit is, oof, wild. Smart sweets are hella expensive. True. What do you think of keto? Been at it for two years. I don't like keto because I like sweets. I like carbs. And I think you should have carbs too. I, I don't think it's healthy to just completely take carbs out of your diet. Wait. Now, I think a large part of why this trend is so common is that people often don't realize that getting lean for a temporary time frame, like a fitness event or a wedding or a photo shoot, is a different goal with a different set of strategies than getting lean and staying lean over the long term. Now, before we get into those strategies to get everyone on the same page, give me one minute to explain how fat loss actually works. Fat loss occurs because of a caloric deficit. This means that you're consuming less calories than you're burning. You consume calories by eating food, and you burn calories in four ways. There's your resting energy expenditure, which is the number of calories your body burns just sitting there, so to keep your heart beating and so on. There's your exercise activity thermogenesis. This is the number of calories you burn from exercising. There's your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT. And this is any activity that isn't exercise. So stuff like getting up, sitting down, typing, and tapping your fingers. And then there's the thermic effect. Of the non-exercise activity thermogenesis is unironically why so many ADHD mother with the exception of me, oftentimes will have the insanely svelte physique of friend of the show, Alex, I did a thing. I did a thing, literally cannot stop fidgeting. I know. He lived with me for like a, a week or so. And this mother can't sit still. He's literally constantly walking around. Walking around the house, constantly doing shit. He can't stop. He can't stop moving. That is, you know, it's like genetic factor. It's almost like genetic, I would say. But it certainly helps. Absolutely. To food, which is the small number of calories your body burns digesting the foods you eat. So let's say we add all that up and it comes out to 2,500 calories burned over the course of a day. And then we tally up everything you ate that day and it was 3,000 calories. That would mean you ran a 500 calorie surplus for that day. 
But if instead of 3000 calories, you only ate 2000 calories, now that would mean you were in a 500 calorie deficit for the day. And if you sustained that 500 calorie deficit over time, you'd lose about one pound per week, which is actually- Which is the maximum amount you should lose if you wanna have a healthy diet. A reasonable target for most people to aim for. So that's all pretty simple, but there's a very important part that many people miss. It's important to realize that as you lose weight, the number of calories you burn will decrease. This is called metabolic adaptation. As you lose weight, you won't burn as many calories through resting energy expenditure because your body is getting smaller. You won't burn as many calories per unit of exercise because your body is becoming more energetically efficient. You won't burn as many calories through NEAT because your body is becoming less hyperactive and fidgety, and you won't burn as many calories through the thermic effect of food because you're eating less food. So keep in mind that the 500 calorie deficit you started out with probably won't be a 500 calorie deficit after a few weeks or months of dieting. And that's because when you decrease the number of calories you're eating, you also indirectly decrease the number of calories you're burning. And sometimes these adaptations can happen very quickly, even within days. So to account for metabolic adaptation, which will occur, you may need to lower calories a bit further to keep up with your desired rate of weight loss, or you can simply accept the fact that your weight loss may take a bit longer than expected. All right, so in order for any fat loss diet to work, it needs to have three crucial things. A sustained caloric deficit to cause fat loss, weight training to support muscle mass, and enough protein to support muscle mass. Usually 1.6 yep. to 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, or 0.7 to one gram per pound, is a good target to aim for. And pretty much everything else, including the number of meals you eat, the timing of those meals, and what specific foods you focus on, can be largely dictated by your own individual preferences. So those are the basics for how you lose fat. Now from here, most people turn to short-term strategies to try to get that fat off as quickly as possible, but this is a mistake. Yes, all the most popular fad diets will cause fat loss in the short term. That's what actually caused them to become so popular in the first place. But low calorie crash diets tend to result in more muscle loss and eventual weight regain. And yes, isolating yourself from social events and avoiding restaurants may help you fend off tempting foods for some time, but can also deteriorate your relationships and eventually make the diet feel unsustainable. And yes, cutting out entire food groups may help you avoid overeating for a while, but can eventually lead to nutrient deficiencies and uncontrollable cravings. He's right. Also, the way I describe it is the foundation of every diet is still calories in, calories out. They just add this like extra seasoning on top of it to make it seem like it's very different than other diets when it's not because you will never lose weight if you eat more calories than you actually consume. That's it. So yeah, when you remove an entire food group from your diet, yeah, it's going to be a lot harder for you to gain weight. You're probably going to, you know, if you, when you take Keto, again, take keto, for example. When you remove carbs, which are a fundamental component of your, of your macronutrient intake every day, you're literally taking one third, it out, one third of it out. Actually, it's more than that on a healthy consumption. If you look at like a balance, if you look at like a macronutrient percentage, you're taking out like usually around 50% of your fucking diet. 50% of the things you eat are carbs. So yeah, you will, you know, you will inevitably lose weight because you are eliminating 50% of your macronutrients from your diet, but it's not consistent. Hassan, is this the same premise for skinny people trying to bulk? I mean, this video, calories in, calories out is always the same. Yes, 500 calories is like, people will say bro science, 500 calories a day uh, is going to help you lose one pound of fat. I don't exactly know how it works for 500 calories a day over, I don't think you'll gain exactly one pound of muscle. That's not how that works because uh, muscle development is actually significantly harder than fat loss because uh, the genetic component is like too... I think the genetic component is OP. Some people put on more muscle mass uh, quickly, but ultimately it's a very, very... It's a very hard process. That's why usually it's very difficult for people to like develop muscle mass um, while they're also trying to cut fat. You can do it. I have done it, but that's the reason why a lot of natty, you know, fitness influencers and whatnot will often gain weight and put on fat as well as put on muscle mass and then cut again. Things that make weight regain inevitable. So if you want to not just get lean, but stay lean, you need to take a better approach. So next, let's dig into three specific strategies that'll help you not only lose the fat, but keep it off over the long term. The third strategy on my list is the most frequently neglected in my experience, but also probably the most important. All right, the first long-term strategy is to diet more slowly so that it barely even feels like you're dieting at all. Now, the general science-based cutting rule is that you should aim to lose around 0.5 to 1% of your body weight per week on a fat loss phase. So if you weigh 200 pounds right now, you should try to lose one to two pounds per week. 
for. In other words, if you wanna cut 20 pounds, it should take you 10 to 20 weeks to get there. This is what I typically recommend as well. However, there may be some benefits to going even slower. In fact, on my own current weight loss journey, I've lost 24 pounds or 11 kilos, and that journey has taken me 40 weeks or just about nine months. I started my cut at 187 pounds or 85 kilos, and now I'm down to 163 pounds or 74 kilos. That evens out to an average weight loss of just over half a pound per week. And because I've taken my sweet time with it, the weight loss itself has felt incredibly easy ridiculously easy. I've been eating out at restaurants, going out with friends, eating pizza and sushi, and the slower pace of things has helped me be very chill about my diet. Now you can see a few times here where my weight spiked noticeably. The first spike was in the middle of August when some friends came to visit Steph and me in Toronto and we were eating out almost every night. I gained two oh or three pounds God! Of weight, but when the I worked, it's really just a tiny blip in the overall trend. This other spike lasted for most of November. I gained four pounds that month, but I was visiting Steph in New Orleans. It was during Thanksgiving. Bro! This part is so real. It's like my fucking 10 pound spike was not a blip, but a gigantic one. And directly, directly caused by my parents being here. The worst, dude. Ultimately, though, at least one of the, uh, I guess one good thing that came from that, though, that came from that process. Yeah, I am blaming my mom. One good thing that came from that entire experience, however, is that like I... I put on a lot more muscle mass in that process. And that's part of the reason why I started lifting a lot heavier weight. So it wasn't all that much of a, uh, it, like it wasn't the worst possible thing that could have happened, but, but it would not have happened. Look, it, it would not have happened unless I like consistently kept working out, which I did. And again, it's not a big deal at all when you zoom out and look at the overall trend. And I think this mindset is not only okay, but actually smarter because it'll help you not only be chill throughout the diet process, it'll help you stay chill once you get to your goal weight. By going slow, you won't feel deprived or eager to get off the diet because you won't feel like you've been dieting very hard all along. This will help you maintain the leanness you eventually reach much more easily, and I think it'll be worth that extra bit of time it takes for you to get there. So to make sure you're losing around that ideal rate of 0.5 to 1% of body weight per week, I'd recommend a caloric deficit around 20% below your current maintenance. To do this, simply take the calories you'd need to maintain your weight right now. This is now big, this is important. 20 Learn it. From it. If you don't know how to find your maintenance calories, I'll put two methods up here on the screen that you can pause and read. And of course, if you don't want to track calories at all, uh -huh. calories, I'll put two methods up here. Multiply your weigh-in in pounds by 14 to 18. If you're more active, you may be closer to body weight times 18 or higher. If you're less active, you're closer to body weight times 14 or lower. If you aren't sure, body weight by 16 is usually reasonably accurate. The second method is guessing and checking. Track your body weight and caloric intake for two weeks. This is what usually uh, good trainers will tell you to do, where you basically eat whatever the fuck you eat normally, and they will look at and they will make you count those calories. You have to literally count every single thing as best as you possibly can. And then they look at your, your body fat and they look at your activity, your daily uh, lifestyle choices. Like, are you sedentary? Are you not sedentary? And then they try to usually make, a, make an assessment off that. Find your maintenance based on the weight change. If you maintain your weight, your average calories is your estimated maintenance. If you lost 0 0.5 to 1 pounds, your maintenance will be roughly 2,000 to 500 calories above, I mean, 200 to 500 calories above your calorie uh, gains. Um, here on the screen that you can pause and read. And of course, if you don't want to track calories at all, you can instead focus on tracking your body weight while making intuitive, common sense, lower calories. That's smart sweets, I'm pretty sure, right? Or no, maybe, no, it's not smart sweets. That's just regular watermelon sour gummies. God, I love those shits. The smart sweet sour watermelon gummies are not that good. Food choices, most of the time. Those are For some the people, regular those simple sour common sense ones. choices will be enough to get things moving. For others, a tool like intermittent fasting can be very helpful. Or if you're like me, to relieve tracking stress, you can just loosely track calories and protein without worrying about the carb and fat numbers. So for example, if I'm eating something that's harder to find the exact macros for, like a specialty sushi roll, I can just eyeball it as five or 600 calories and call it a day. This way, it only takes me a total of maybe five minutes a day to track what I eat. Yeah, as long as you, as long as you get your, your minimum daily protein, your minimum daily protein needs met. As long as a fitness streamer now, no, but I've, I've talked about fitness in your mom's see all the t goddamn time. So why are you surprised? Especially when I'm fit in this top of the hour ad break also directly after fitness in your mom. Okay. And if you no longer want to avoid me fitness in your mom, well, you can't, you know, you can't do that. I'm your dad now. I'm not the stepfather, but the father that stepped up. But if you do want to avoid the ads at the top of the hour, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime. 
or by getting gifted a sub. Lucky, thank you for the 10 gifted subs. Here's the three minute ad break now. That was his first message in like two years. I love when someone comes back and just says some dumb shit. Giuseppe Carbonara, thank you for the 10 gifted subs over here. I use my fitness pal, which unfortunately I think changed stuff. I, I have a premium one, but back in the day it was like the best. It saved my life. But for what I understand, I think they paywalled the barcode scanner, which is really fucked up. The song steps on, thank you for the five gifted subs. Chronometer? Oh, okay. I like my fitness pal because it has like a massive library of calories. And for years and years and years, people have crowdsourced it, including myself. I have crowdsourced. I have been a part of like the crowdsourcing operation of like adding calories in. I've used it for like five, six, seven years almost. And, um, you know, it's pretty good. 9.43 out of 10. God damn, that chatter must be feeling bad right now. I should also mention that in addition to giving yourself plenty of time to get lean, you also need to give yourself a realistic end target. No matter how slow you go, you simply can't expect to maintain 6% body fat all year round. Unless you're on steroids, baby. Beer, 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 beer. Anabolic steroids. Listen, listen. One of the greatest indicators that someone is on steroids is if they are at five to 6% body fat year round okay there is perhaps no better there's perhaps no better marker for that at a certain point your sleep libido energy and mood will all plummet and all you'll ever be able to think about is food so even if you could do it this isn't a state of existence worth maintaining anyway generally speaking most men can expect to maintain something between 10 and 20 percent body fat which looks something like this granted i do think that your starting place can impact where you end up for example, if you've been sitting at 40% body fat for 10 years, it might be harder for you to maintain 20% body fat than it is for someone who's genetically leaner to maintain 8% body fat. But you just need to find an endpoint that's realistic for you and realize that everyone is unique in terms of how low they can comfortably go. Someone else's 8% might be your 18% and that's okay. For women, the realistic range tends to be between 18 and 28% body fat, which looks something like this. And once again, the bottom line is that if you're trying to maintain a physique that's leaner than your genetic body fat set range, it'll be very hard for you to sustain, even if you do everything else right. Okay, the second long-term strategy is to leverage True. habits to make the diet feel as easy as possible. Regardless of how motivated you feel right now as you watch this video. Nerf by nature? What do you mean? That's not a bad thing. You don't have to have like low body fat percentage. Is I would say the opposite. What? It's literally better that you don't have to be at like 6% body fat, dude. What the f Plus it looks different on women too. Like that's the other thing. Actually, your motivation will dip back down. When that happens, and it will happen, if you haven't built the right habits, you'll most likely start veering off track. However, if you can operate on autopilot, you've got nothing to worry about is on when this happens. So I want to share a couple of my favorite science-based habit building techniques that you can use to make your life a whole lot easier in those later stages when most people slip up. The first habit building technique is called temptation bundling. This is when you pair an activity that you already want to do with an activity that supports your weight loss goal. For example, I really enjoy watching true crime video essays on YouTube. This behavior comes naturally for me, but I don't love doing cardio and I'm often tempted to skip it. However, Mark. This is really smart. Not as smart as me playing Valorant right now, so I'm gonna cut into this content for the time being because I promised that I would be ready at four and now they're waiting for me as always. But we will get back to reacts, including Steven Crowder going on Tim Pool in a, a, in a little bit. But you know, smart like that. And if you don't wanna miss out on any of that content, you're gonna have to sit through my fucking Valor gameplay, which I know some of you hate that when I say it, but it's good, I promise. You know one thing that people could do? is literally watch my stream while you're uh playing i mean uh while you're working out i'm literally working out right now good work harder work harder work harder keep pushing don't stop pushing is that good was that helpful i hope it was i will also be continuing with my react to the jeff nippert video right now as a matter of fact while we wait for this but um yeah, we're going to keep watching this and also activity. Steven Crowder uh, highlights when he goes on Tim Pool's show. ...of watching crime videos with the less enjoyable activity of doing cardio, I'm much less tempted to skip the cardio. Some of my bodybuilder friends do this by playing video games while hitting their cardio at home. As another example, if you're trying to build the habit of meal prepping on Sundays, try saving your favorite podcast for when it's time to do your meal prep. That way, you'll make that new behavior more gratifying in the moment. I love my other this. habit building technique is to align... I do this shit all the time. People always ask me like, how do you start? How do you start playing? Uh, I mean, how do you start working out in the gym or whatever? This is a great 
This is literally something. It, it's weird to think about because like, it's not like I knew that he was doing this. But it's something that I have done as well. To build healthy habits, I usually try to reward myself for things that I would otherwise like not do, I guess, by, by either like, you know, I love playing basketball, so that's entertaining for me. So that's easy cardio. But if I'm supposed to do cardio on my own and it feels bad and I don't want to do it, uh, one way to get over that is by just watching shit on your phone, you know, something that you enjoy watching. Um, it really helped with my meal preps as well. Uh, being able to being able to just like watch some shit while I'm meal prepping. It's huge. It's a huge, huge uh, benefit. Align your everyday environment with your goals. For example, if there's a particular food that you consistently overeat, maybe leave it on the shelf next time you're grocery shopping. Or if you're regularly stress eating at night. Cookies are a great example. Yes, not Chips Ahoy cookies, but like I can't have cookies. Two things I can't have, cookies and pizza. Why? Because when I have a slice of pizza, I can't stop. Like, you know, people say like Pringles, it's like once you pop, you can't stop. For me, it's not Pringles, it's mother cookies uh and and pizza i will literally sit down and consume 3,000 calories worth of cookies without even thinking about it which is only when you think about it not that much it's like 10 cookies right 10 big cookies it's really fucked up same with pizza a slice of pizza is 300 calories just like a one cookie usually is 300 calories i eat at least 10 of those in one sitting i can't stop until i'm hitting 10 of those you know it is pretty fucked up keep alternative stress relievers like video games books and puzzles close by so you can use them for stress relief instead if you're missing gym time in the morning because you scroll on your phone before getting out of bed try leaving your phone in a different room or picking up an old school alarm clock to get you up faster now, if you do everything that I've said in this video so far, or even most of what I've said, you will reach your goal. You absolutely will. However, that's not the end. Once you've reached your goal, you need a plan for what to do next. And this is the part that almost everyone what knows. Is that? What is so happening? The third and final strategy is to have a smart post-diet plan. Now, All right. now, there are two very common mistakes that I see people make after reaching their fat loss goal. The first and probably most common mistake is when people just don't have any post-diet plan at all. In this case, as motivation decreases, no such thing as a post diet plan, ladies and gentlemen, it's your diet. You can have a healthy one. You can have an unhealthy one, but it's still your diet. Okay. And that's why I think the best advice that I've ever gotten with respect to my diet is like a diet is about making healthier choices, making healthier substitutions that you can use for the rest of your life. That's it. They revert back to their old eating habits and gradually creep up in weight until eventually they're back to square one. The solution here is pretty simple. You just need a post-diet plan. We'll get to that in a minute. The second mistake, which is more common amongst the more sciencey fitness crowd, is meticulous reverse dieting. This can be just as bad as the first mistake if it drags out the diet unnecessarily, keeps you hungry for longer than you need to be, and leads to an eventual breakdown of willpower. Now, I'm planning to cover reverse dieting in detail in a future video, but for now, reverse dieting is when you gradually increase your calories from your deficit intake up to your maintenance intake over the course of several weeks or months. And even though it's quite popular, I don't actually recommend it as part of a post-diet plan. Instead, I recommend going to your new maintenance calories right away. If you no longer have the goal of losing weight, why be in a caloric deficit? If you're not cutting anymore, you should get to maintenance and get on with your new goal of maintaining. Now, finding your new maintenance calories at the end of a diet can take a bit of trial and error, but for the most part, should be something around 200 to 600 calories above what you were eating at the end of your cut. So let's say you were eating 2,000 calories by the end of your diet. The Match very next found. day, you should boost your calories up to 2,200 to 2,600 calories, probably closer to 2,600 if you didn't crash diet. Is it possible? I'm very skinny and trying to gain muscle. Is it possible to just gain muscle or do I have to gain other weight first? Wait, what do you mean? I mean, Gaining muscle is more complicated than just simply losing fat. And um, the way, I mean, you're going to gain some fat while you're gaining muscle as well. I mean, you can do like a, like a super lean bulk. Look at this 320 beast. No way. 6'5", 320. Wait. Okay, to be fair, he has, uh, he ha he's double jointed. Uh, he has hyper laxity. Why do I know that? Because I have it as well. I'm six foot four, and even when I was 320 pounds, I was capable of doing, well, not 320 pounds, but like, I, I was capable of doing most of the shit. I don't think I could do that. I, I don't think I could go that far, but that is super easy, like this. That I can do as well. That I cannot do. Woo! You just need to work at it. 
Taylor downloads hypermobility gang. Yeah. That's why he can do that. But respect. What makes it actually really, really uh, crazy is like when you're that size and you can do all of that shit. That means it, it is like, because it's super hard to work out when you have, uh, when you're hyper, when you have hypermobility. Um, because like that means your joints are weak. So you, you are capable, you're, you're, you have a higher risk of injury when you're putting up weight. I'm going to keep it real with you, man. You will never hit that yoinky sploinky. I'll put it on TikTok when I do it. Okay. Hey, if you like this video, please subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. <laughs>